Episode 4, The Monopoly, Don't Pass Go. Lack of adequate pain relief for intractable pain patients and sanctions and imprisonment for doctors and prescribers seem to be the rules of this game. A handicapped match. A ruthless game that IPPs and their advocates are neither suited for nor interested in playing. Meanwhile, criminal chemists and drug dealers are left alone to continue their growing, vicious, and deadly free-for-all street party. The CDC guideline, followed by DEA enforcement, has physicians and pharmacists being blamed for an addiction crisis and used as scapegoats in America's war on drugs. Even the American Medical Association, as conservative as they are, has complained about these guidelines and complained that the CDC had no business in there and complained about this malicious prosecution of pharmacists, of uh, physicians, and this have, got, have been outspoken about the misclassification of drug diseases and those sort of things. They have come out and said anything about it, but very few people in Congress have paid attention to this. Meet Norm. Norm is Dr. Norman Clement, a pharmacist and pharmacy owner in Tampa, Florida, who has been practicing pharmacy for 45 years and has been on the receiving end of the DEA's close and personal attention. One day, August 29th, they came in after they couldn't find anything wrong with their work. They came in did this, what we call this fictitious ring approach, stating that we were producing oxycodone and hydromorphone. We were making it up, manufacturing, you know. And of course, we look at these warrants, and these warrants again reflect what we began to see all over the country. And these warrants that lack probable cause, these fictitious warrants in creation. You know, you know what it takes to, to make, in other words, they're saying we were manufacturing oxycodone, in other words, we were taking it from the root product, baby and processing it into oxycodone and dispensing the bully nilly And then hydromorphone, I mean, this is what it says on these notes, okay? This is the pattern of their behavior, to go in and, accuse, and, and, and they use these defective warrants to go in and say, well, the doctor dispensed 100,000 uh, oxycodone, or he wrote a prescription for 800,000 alaprazolam. That sort of thing over the past 20 years and stuff. Those warrants are that, and, and you'll see that the DEA's arrest warrants and warrants are, are fictitious. I mean, they're all based upon numbers. They're not based upon the scene states. You know, what is the patient, what are the patients that are, they're being treated for? You know, what are the problems, the, what radiographs they looked at? What patients did they interview? Found out they didn't interview anybody. You know, they just came in and just made up stuff. And using their pattern, then they use this word. Anytime you hear certain cold words, they use opioid, pill mill, large numbers of doses is being written. People should focus in on that because that shows you that these guys, we call it armed with badges and guns and profound stupidity when it comes to, 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 to the field of, of medicine and those sort of things. I am a pharmacist. People we're saying are physicians. We're treating people for a medical condition and not drug deal. And these guys have developed a whole industry in which to entrap, which they can creatively entrap doctors into uh, into a fictitious guideline in order to send doctors to prison. Let's see what the DEA has to say. Is it true that prescribers are targeted and punished for how many pills they prescribe per month? No. Once a prescriber is tagged or shut down, is it disclosed to the public which pills or pill strength were prescribed or what ailments the prescriber's patients suffered from? No. That's Sarah Boblins, Diversion Program Manager with the DEA. She did not agree with the prescribers who say they are targeted for pill numbers. However, she did confirm that which pills 
or opioids, the strength of those pills, or what a patient is being treated for, is not disclosed to the public, even as a physician is being marked for questioning. Being that patients' records are supposedly confidential, you may be wondering, how would the DEA ever know what opioids or medications a clinician is prescribing his or her patients? Or, how does a physician come to be tagged for questioning? A great portion of this complex issue lies in four simple letters, PDMP, which stands for Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, the DEA is accessing PDMP systems that are established on a statewide basis. It's been stated that PDMPs are used by the DEA to spy on the medical records of patients who have been prescribed opioid pain medication and the doctors who prescribe them, and that the DEA is accessing the records without a warrant and approval of a judge. This has been frowned upon by many and thought to be illegal based upon the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, also known as HIPAA, which restricts access to the medical records of patients. It's also been said that while the DEA is peering into the PDMP system, they are also able to see other medications a patient may be taking outside of opioids. This could be especially problematic for patients taking psychiatric medication or any medication that could be viewed as stigmatizing. It is troubling that as patients, our medical privacy is in question. It's also troubling that a provider's sacred relationship with their patients can be placed in jeopardy at any moment, along with their life's work, professional confidence, and personal freedom. Dr. J. Joshi, general practitioner in northern Indiana, is one of the hundreds of clinicians who know this trouble firsthand after being arrested and jailed by the DEA for the treatment of pain with prescription opioids. Dr. Joshi, is it true that you once had a run-in with the DEA? Unfortunately, yes, I did. What happened is, a few months after I opened my clinic in Munster, Indiana, a primary care practice, a former employee of mine began using my name and credentials to essentially write scripts for herself. They were a mixture of opioids, certain Xanax, and at times I believe it was Adderall as well writing for herself and for friends in our community. I did not find out about this until months after when I actually received a letter from her insurance company inquiring as to why there were so many different prescriptions being written to her under my credentials. Um, Essentially, I was shocked and I subsequently fired her. I then reported her to the police. Uh, This was the Monster Police, the local law enforcement agency. Uh, Essentially what had happened is the DEA was already looking at what was going on because they were flagged by the high number of prescription of controlled substances that were being emanated under my name. And essentially when I filed a police report on her, the Monster Police then took that information to the DEA and instead of prosecuting that employee, uh, turned around and prosecuted me. Uh, basically, what the DEA did was they sent an undercover agent to my practice under the pretense that this patient was in pain, had lower extremity pain, leg pain is what he described, and that he wanted to continue his medications. Uh, he asked for a moderate dose of Vicodin. I told him I wasn't comfortable with that. I wanted to give a lower dose of Norco, which was... Now, incidentally, well within the CDC guidelines for the acceptable range to start a medication of opioids to a patient with an existing history, a non-naive opioid patient. Essentially what they did is they took the statements from that former employee and they took certain interpretations from my care of that undercover agent, namely the regular but not fully comprehensive musculoskeletal 
physical exam. And the fact that I prescribed opioids to a patient prior to obtaining medical records, even though I had made that request, they stated that the employee statements, perjured as they were, the undercover agent visits with the quality of the physical exam and the lack of medical records prior to prescribing opioids constituted uh, the factual basis for a guilty plea. And it was interesting because this undercover agent actually filled out the patient registration forms. And as part of that form, one of the questions I ask is, do you have a history of drug abuse? And they mentioned, no, I don't. And when I asked, would you like to try alternative medications in addition to opioids? I even sent an order for an imaging study. It, it was interesting because essentially the act of prescribing an opioid to a patient superseded any clinical decision making, any care management. It was almost as if the act of prescribing was the focus, not the care management in totality, which I thought was a very interesting perspective that the DEA took when they were investigating me. So then the question becomes, why did I plead guilty? Well, I went through two defense attorneys, and neither of them were really interested in defending me. It was really at the peak of the opioid epidemic hysteria. And essentially what they said was, they targeted you. You are the one that they wanted. So you have to plead guilty. It was just that simple and just that illogical. That's essentially how law enforcement operated at the height of the opioid epidemic. It was essentially the accusation serving as the basis for the conviction. And, you know, I uh, pled guilty. And unfortunately, I was sentenced to 11 months in prison. But the good news is that I've since regained my medical license and have opened my practice. So now I am um, back practicing in the Maryville area and taking care of patients like I were before all of this had happened. Uh, and it's really interesting, my perspective on all of this, looking back, because what the DEA essentially wanted me to do was not listen to this patient, this undercover agent, not continue the medications that the patient told me he was taking, and simply distrust the patient. And if you were to take that mindset, you, you're essentially not trusting your patients. Chagnon is another experienced physician with over 20 years of service to her patients. Though, still, she too understands she is being watched and is unable to be completely comfortable in her life's work as she knows her clinical privileges are constantly on the line. My approach to opioids has been, I have seen both the good and the bad they can do. And I will say that I have never had a patient overdose. I've never had a patient um, have uh, any a, a car accident on them. I've never had a patient um, uh, thrown into jail for, for selling them. I've never, I mean, you can do this safely and effectively. So I use them with anxiety now, not because I'm afraid that I don't know how to use them, but because the people who are watching don't know what they're talking about, quite honestly. They don't. But my patient's welfare is set directly against my welfare in many ways is because I'm looking at people who are looking over my shoulder, who every time I write a prescription can log into a computer database and track it, or a pharmacist can can report me on Narc's care, and and say, look, she look at look at what she's prescribing, but I know my patients. I've spent hours with them. I see almost all of them every month, even no matter how little they're on. I see them every month. So, and I keep track of all of that. And, and yet you can have somebody who sees them at a pharmacy window, decides in a flash they're on too much medication and can report me. And so every time a prescription is written, and by the way, this was absolutely intentional from the authorities. They knew this was going to happen. They've been very effective in this. We think twice, three times and four times about, are, am I going to write the same prescription again? And how much do I have to justify it? Well, that justification is like, you know, well, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So is justification. 
it all depends on who's reading your justification. And it, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's very, very anxiety producing when you have this dichotomous, uh, force on you where you have a patient that you want the best for, you've seen what it can do, you know them, you trust them, you're monitoring them. And then you have this amorphous, invisible force that can come into your life at any moment and decide, well, no, we don't agree. Well, that's, you know, so, so it's, it's that the, the approach to opioids now is a very complicated one. So, and it's not scientific anymore. It's political and emotional. And that's not where, that's not what we should be concerned with. It, it, and and it's lost all sense of of uh, of reason in this country, and unfortunately, it's bled over into Canada and certain other Western European cultures that have followed our lead. It's it's not reasonable. It's not scientific. Essentially, the federal government is incentivizing patients to abuse illicit opioids by restricting their access to medical care, and I think that the government really needs to look into what type of behavior they're incentivizing by the manner in which they interpret and subsequently enforce healthcare laws. I asked Bob Lenz about her opinion on the significant decrease in the availability of opioid pain medication alongside a continuing increase in overdose deaths, with the majority of overdoses being a result of illicit fentanyl and heroin from China and Mexico. I reminded her that in cases of overdose deaths, case files often indicate that the substances in the individual's body at the time of their death show that the vast majority had a number of illicit substances in their systems, in addition to heroin and fentanyl, such as cocaine, methamphetamines, and benzodiazepines. Alcohol was also very common. It was indicated that people who did have prescription opioids in their system were not necessarily prescribed the medication. Here's what she said. Yes, uh, fentanyl has been coming into the United States and it's been illicitly manufactured outside of the country through a synthesis process. And that seems to be what's driving a lot of DEA's casework right now. And then uh, poly drug use is also pretty big. So I would say that prescriptions for opiates have decreased over the last couple of years. And to replace that, people have turned to street drugs. A little more on fentanyl. Fentanyl is very rapidly absorbed if taken in a pill form. So therefore, it's never manufactured legally in a pill or oral form. It's only used as a dermal or skin patch or a lollipop and possibly a lozenger that you can suck on slowly because oral fentanyl kills. According to Pain News Network, the abundance of fentanyl on the street is rarely a result of diversion and is unrelated to the supply of pharmaceutical or prescription fentanyl. These are different drugs much as the cocaine nasal spray recently approved by the FDA as a local anesthetic is completely separate from the cocaine bought on the street. Pain experts are now pushing for a new classification for illicit fentanyl analogs in the hope of clarifying this difference. Most of the fentanyl and fentanyl-related deaths that government is complaining about come from illicit fentanyl that is found and is killing in the street. According to the DEA, it's being taken orally and also comes in a powder form. Also, fentanyl has been added to heroin, making it even worse. I've spoken to many physicians and healthcare experts who stress the point that illegal fentanyl deaths are specifically contaminated chemical deaths and should be expressed as such. They say that because nobody knows the correct dose of an illegal drug, those deaths should not be considered overdose deaths. They state that by using the word overdose over and over again, it makes it sound as if it's related to prescription medication. 
and it's not. There is no legal dose of an illegal drug, and therefore, these are not overdose deaths. These are poisoning deaths from chemicals made in some hidden laboratory somewhere. Many healthcare providers say that the DEA has consistently told them that they have nothing to fear as long as they document everything they do and abide by the law. They say that despite following those given instructions, their offices are still being raided and they are being treated like criminals. What is your response to that? I would say that a DEA registered practitioner is required to follow rules and regulations under their state boards with the regard to the practice of medicine. And if they keep uh, records that they're required to keep by the state, like patient records and prescription records, and if they have those records to show what they have dispensed and also um, how they secured their controlled substances, Uh, that they hold under that DEA registration number, they're most likely on the up and up, and they shouldn't worry. Um, DEA will continue to investigate practitioners who are purportedly prescribing outside of the scope of normal professional practice, and we gather evidence, and if we find through analysis that prescriptions were written outside of the scope of normal professional practice, and the U.S. Attorney's Office agrees to take a criminal complaint on the doctor, then we've done our job. It's unfortunate when a practitioner is not providing the care that a patient deserves to have because they've all taken an oath that they're first not going to do any harm. And when they're writing prescriptions for patients without conducting a full medical exam or getting a history or understanding the underlying conditions in the patient's complaint with their ailments, that's not good medical care either. And practitioners should not be allowed to continue to practice bad medicine or get people addicted on opioids or any other controlled substance. So the DEA continues to investigate diversion that falls outside of the closed system of distribution. If we find that there are uh, pharmacies that are selling drugs out the back door, if we find that there's a practitioner who's not practicing good medicine and prescribing outside the normal scope of their professional practice, Um, If we find that there's diversion or people stealing prescriptions or whatever, we're doing our job. We're supposed to investigate that. And then the special agents that work for DEA also conduct investigations on all of the other illicit controlled substances that are coming into the United States. That would include methamphetamine, illicit fentanyl, heroin, and marijuana. Most would agree that any clinician with the license and authority to prescribe opioids should not be permitted to continue practicing if they are not prescribing or practicing responsibly or ethically. The issue of opioid addiction is much more complex, however, and doesn't quite boil down to the opioid addiction or the opioid crisis being a result of poor prescribing or prescribing at all. In fact, Frontiers in Pain Research, a medical journal, references studies and data showing that less than 3% of pain patients become addicted from the opioids they are prescribed. In the next episode, as we seek more answers, we'll find out what consequences an ominous DEA and state medical board presence has had on the practice of pain medicine and the treatment of pain, and what this has meant for the millions of pain patients, clinicians, and their families. I'm Eve, and this is Chronic, The Pain Game.